Have you ever been stuck in a rain cloud of negative voices just pouring down on you? Have you ever experienced an invisible weight on your chest? Have you ever been bored but without the energy to do anything about it? Have you ever been stuck in that moment right before you come up from underwater and your lungs are empty of air and you're desperate for oxygen and it's right there, but it's almost like you get stuck forever before you can break the surface? Have you ever felt like you forgot to do something important, but all the time? This is how real people describe what it is like to experience anxiety. And statistically speaking, if you're watching this today, about 30 to 40% of us will experience a diagnosable form of anxiety over some point in our lifetime. The other 60% of us will care about, will love somebody who does, and about 100% of us will at least experience the symptoms of anxiety just by the nature that we are human beings and we live in a universe that is unpredictable, that we cannot control. For me, when I think about some of my earliest memories, I mean, four and five years old, I remember as soon as it would get dark outside, it's like the air would get thicker around me because I would start to fear those fatal words when my parents would say, it's time to get ready for bed. And when they would do that, I knew I was gonna be heading up to my room soon. And for about a two year stretch, there was a time window where I had nightmares every single night. And so I knew I was getting closer to that moment where even though we checked for monsters under the bed and in the closet, ultimately the door would finally close and I would be alone and a nightmare would come and I'd wake up, you know, midnight, one in the morning and would just be alone with my thoughts and would just stare at the ceiling. And like this weight, this invisible weight is on my chest and there's nothing I could do about it. And Sunday nights would be twice as bad because Sunday nights, the weight of the school week would be coming and there wouldn't be any, you know, one particular test that I was stressed about, but the weight of just being around all these different people and having to perform and make good grades and whatever games were coming. I mean, all of that was weighing on me. And then I became a teenager. And then I guess I became an adult. And now the monsters, instead of being these, you know, made up imaginary creatures, now they take on the faces of of real people that I know, people that I care about and people that I'm concerned are going to be disappointed in me, are going to be let down by me, perhaps are going to leave our church or the wait now to perform feels like the consequences are so much bigger because now it feels like if I don't perform, perhaps it'll affect my job or affect my career, affect important relationships in my life or my marriage. And now I seriously have stretches today, months at a time where I sleep just like I did when I was four or five years old. And it's like clockwork and I sleep just a couple hours a night because I wake up about one in the morning and I just stare at the ceiling and toss and turn and my mind just goes and goes and goes. And no matter how much I try to shut it off, there's just this constant cycle of all these things I didn't get to and all these people I may have let down and perhaps are angry at me and I feel this weight of this negativity that just spirals. No matter how hard I try, I can't shut it off. The reason that we're having this conversation today is because we are in part two of our series called In Your Head. And specifically, this series is all about mental health. We said that there's no universal definition for mental health, but specifically what we're talking about over the course of these couple weeks is our emotional, our psychological, and our social well-being. Our emotional meaning feeling appropriately, which doesn't always mean just feeling happy. It means feeling sad when it's appropriate to feel sad, angry when it's appropriate to feel angry. Our psychological, meaning the pattern of our thoughts, what it is that we give our time to think about, and our social well-being, meaning the most important relationships in our life, our communities, our tribes, our most intimate relationships, and how it is that we're connected to them. As we move in the direction of greater mental health, ultimately what happens is we get more present in the most important relationships in our life. We're more productive and engaged at work. We experience more peace. We experience more joy, perhaps. Maybe we just get our sleep back. And we said that mental health ultimately exists on a spectrum for all of us, just like with physical health, how we all could get at least a little bit physically healthier. All of us can get a little bit mentally healthier. It's not just this on or off switch. We also acknowledge that it is very, very complex. There are a lot of layers to this. There's a a genetic element. There's a physical element, a relational, a, a trauma, a zero to 18. There's a spiritual element to all of this. And for some of us, this series is gonna have way too much Jesus because we're angry at God. Perhaps we're not good with him right now. We don't wanna over-spiritualize it. We don't want that kind of forced on us. 
And for others of us, it's not going to have nearly enough Jesus because we just want a Bible verse. We just kind of want to fix it that way, but we're going to take a holistic approach and talk about the whole person. In fact, if you missed part one, you're watching this right now and you didn't see the first part, I might even suggest that you just pause this and go back to the first part. You can watch it on double speed and get caught up because we very much just lay the foundation for where we're going in the rest of this series. But we put out this North Star, this kind of one word target, if you, we, if you will. And we said, what we're going towards is this. We're fighting for connection because mental health is cultivated by connection. Very specifically in three important relationships in our life. Connection with ourselves, doing the hard work to just be with ourselves to discover what's going on inside of us, what it is that we're feeling, where it is that those feelings come from, as well as connectedness to others and our connection with our heavenly father. We said when any of those are disconnected, we're gonna drift towards mental unhealth instead. Now, as we think about connection, now we wanna get a little bit more specific in the course of this series because the subtitle, as these parts go on, the subtitle of this series is the battle with mental health, anxiety, and depression. So today we're getting more granular on anxiety specifically. And I think anxiety is one of those things where if you think, man, at times the church just seems like they don't get it. Maybe you've seen a pastor that feels like they just kind of missed it or just said, have more faith and you'll get over it. They don't really understand your anxiety. It seems like they've never had anxiety. I think it has to do with people taking certain statements out of context because the Bible does have so much to say about anxiety. I mean, for example, when you see verses like this, you see Paul say, do not be anxious about anything. Or you see Jesus and Matthew say, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. Or when you see Peter say something like, cast all your anxieties on him, which sounds like just have more faith and it'll be okay. When you see these little snippets taken out of context, well, sure, that's frustrating. Because that feels just like, don't feel how you feel. Like, just go fix it. Just go figure it out. That feels like somebody who has never experienced anxiety before, especially when this is stuck on a coffee mug or a t-shirt or bumper sticker or something like that. The reality is these weren't even the full sentences, much less the full paragraph, the letter, the context that these statements were in. In reality, these authors writing so much on anxiety, it shows that they do get anxiety normalizing that what you experience, you are not alone. Not only that, but there is hope. There is hope that there is a way forward that we can do something about it. So when you look at these in their context, absolutely, there's so much that they have to offer and so much that they have to say, but there's confusion around some of the core, core questions having to do with anxiety that I think we may just have to answer first. For example, I think these verses start to come to life if we can get some clarity around what is anxiety really? We see it all the time and people, you know, talk about it and it's on social media, but at the end of the day, what is anxiety actually? I think some of us might discover that we don't struggle with anxiety as much as we thought because it was something else and we were confused. A few of us may realize we do after actually struggle with anxiety, but we didn't have the language for it. I want to answer that question. I want to answer what actually causes anxiety and what can we ultimately do about it? At the end of our time, I want to look at the story of an individual where we get to see his kind of behind the scenes battle and struggle with mental health. But I think just getting some clarity on these basic questions first real quick will help with where we're going at the end. So to start with what is anxiety actually, like what is it really? I think it is helpful to clarify that there is a difference between anxiety and stress. Although we use the two interchangeably and we kind of go back and forth with them, it, stress is different because if anxiety is kind of the invisible weight on your chest, then stress is the visible weight on your chest. It is something that you can actually see. And if this is you in the gym, please stop and seek help immediately. But the second you can get a weight off of your chest, something that's probably time stamped that you can see it in front of you, well, then the stress will go away. For example, uh, I'm pursuing my master's degree right now and Monday of this last week, I had a paper due at midnight. And as of Monday morning, I still hadn't started on the paper yet. I'm kind of hoping that my professor doesn't watch and keep up with these messages. But, you know, I throughout the day was thinking about it and it kind of had a bigger weight as I got into the afternoon. And then by the time that I got home, seven o'clock and I haven't begun it yet, it seems huge. At that point, it's kind of all that I can think about. But the second that I hit submit, the weight 
was gone. I mean, I was a little tired because I had, you know, put some energy into it, but the stress was behind me. I wasn't anxious about the deadline. I was stressed about it. You probably aren't anxious about your work deadlines. You're stressed about them. You aren't so much anxious about the bills as you are stressed about them. Anxiety, though, is a little different. Anxiety is the feeling of unease, worry, or nervousness that can be subtle or extreme and debilitating, often without any clear beginning or end. We may have some ideas, you know, where it sneaks up on us or some environments where we're a little bit more susceptible to anxiety, but we ultimately don't really know why it comes on oftentimes. And we definitely don't know what is the on-off switch to just make it go away. Ultimately, what anxiety does is it robs us. It robs us of moments. It robs us of opportunities, of relationships. You wanted to be engaged. You know, you wanted to, you know, be productive at work. You wanted to meet the deadline. You wanted to go to that event. You wanted to hang out with those people. You wanted to go on the date, but anxiety kept you from it. It stood in the way. I think the most important thing that I could clarify about the definition of anxiety or or challenge you with, perhaps, if you disagree with me, is I would like to suggest that anxiety ultimately is a symptom. It is always the result of something underlying. When you think about cause and effect, anxiety is the effect. Yes, I know you can be diagnosed with anxiety, of course. I know you can have no idea where the anxiety is coming from. I absolutely get that. But when you say, I struggle or I suffer from anxiety, which is totally appropriate to say, it is similar to saying, I suffer from a fever, which you also do. I mean, a fever is uncomfortable. You are not your best self when you have a fever, but it is a signal that something is wrong underneath. Anxiety is the check engine light to your soul, to your heart, to your emotions, to your mental health. And I want to suggest that this is actually good news. Because if there's something underneath our anxiety, it means that we can do something about it whether it's physical, whether it's genetics, whether it's something relational in our lives, if it's something spiritual, if there's something underneath it, it means we can make progress. It means that we're ultimately not a victim to our anxiety and it's just gonna come back up and there's nothing we can really do about it, but endure it. And so that's a natural lead into the second question that was on there to say, well, then what causes anxiety? What can we actually do about it? And to make it as simple as possible, I would like to suggest this. The causes of anxiety are really anything, past, present, or future, that disrupts our peace. Anything that has happened to us that we haven't yet healed from, or perhaps that we carry shame or or embarrassment with, anything in the present that is causing chaos or disrupting our lives, or in the future that we fear could, or something that maybe could happen again, any of those things are disruptors of our peace and thus are the potential for anxiety. So to keep it very simple and kind of surface level as an example, this could be anything physical, for example. If you aren't sleeping well at night or you don't prioritize sleep, if you never exercise, if you take in excessive amounts of caffeine or alcohol or sugar or drugs, all of those things are going to cause you anxiety because they're going to disrupt your peace. As you try to think about what disrupts our relational or our emotional, our mental, our spiritual peace, it obviously gets a little bit complicated. But one of the things that does play into our potential triggers for anxiety are the ways that we personally are wired because we are not all wired the same. In fact, when you look across you know, human populations, there's all kinds of different things that drive us in terms of our, of our desires or in terms of our core fears. For some people, safety and stability and security are paramount. And so anything that kind of disrupts that, a, a person who is you know, maybe unpredictable or frequently changing plans or when the future is even more uncertain than normal, those are gonna be triggers for anxiety. Others of us value performance and achievement. And so anytime that we feel like we might fail or that our reputation is on the line, that can be more anxiety inducing for us. Other people value relationships and being connected and the ability to help in relationships. And if you feel stuck and like there's nothing you can do about somebody else's pain, that could potentially cause anxiety for you. As you get to know you better, you will discover potential causes for your individual anxiety. However, There is something that causes anxiety for all of us, regardless of our wiring, regardless of our personalities, and that is secrets. 
look, I'm, I'm definitely not trying to be judgmental here. There's, you know, in no way am I trying to condemn you with this. But the point is to say, this is almost more of a logical thing. If you are giving energy to something that you have to cover up, and you're having to think about what it is that you've said about it before and kind of how you've twisted it now and who knows and who doesn't know. And if somebody walks in the room, did they find out if this secret is causing disconnection with the most important people in your life? Remember how last week we said it's connection with others that moves us towards mental health. Well, if we're more disconnected because of a secret, we're gonna move in the opposite direction. Secrets absolutely disrupt our peace. Another thing that it's a disruptor of peace for each of us, regardless of our personalities, is our past hurts, mistakes, and traumas. Things that have happened to us that we haven't yet healed from and processed or ways in which we have perhaps hurt or failed others and we still carry the shame and the embarrassment and the guilt of that today. Now, these things are heavy, right? This is massive, and that wasn't even a comprehensive list. So, What do we actually do about it? What is the way forward? How can we experience some relief with all of these things? Ultimately, it actually might be a little bit simpler than you would think in terms of our options because we really have three options when it comes to managing our anxiety. The first is we can manage symptoms in a way that increases anxiety. This is anything that we do would, you know, for perhaps a, a second or maybe a couple minutes or maybe a night of relief, probably anything that falls in a numbing category. I mean, this goes to, you know, any kind of substances that we would abuse. This is, you know, one too many drinks. This is excessive screen time. This is pornography. This is inappropriate relationships that we just know that relationship is toxic and we shouldn't keep going back to it, but we do it anyways to feel good for a night. But with all of these things, we feel twice as anxious in the morning. And over time, the net is going to be more anxiety. Our second option then is to manage symptoms in a way that temporarily reduces anxiety. And this is actually a really important set of tools to develop. Just like if you did have a fever, you'd probably take ibuprofen first to get that fever under control so you can see what it is that is causing it. If you have a sore throat, you know, you take a a throat lozenge before you get to strep or whatever is causing it. The same is true with our symptoms with anxiety. You do want to neutralize first. You do want to stabilize first a lot of these symptoms that we are experiencing. So figuring out what that looks like for you in a healthy way is going to be really important. There's all kinds of tools for this. You can Google search this. A great counselor is going to lead you to a lot of these. But for you, if that's, you know, prayer, if that's meditation, if that's journaling, if that's going for a walk, if it's exercise, reading a good book, a connective conversation with a friend, however you express yourself creatively or artistically, perhaps music, all of those things are going to be important in terms of providing some stability and some safety so that you can go forward. However, manage your symptoms forever and ultimately anxiety will never lessen or go away. It may over time even continue to increase, which is why I would like to suggest option number three, which is manage our symptoms with the goal of getting to the root cause, to the goal of discovering what is underneath. And you could go back through and you could look at any of those causes and you could say, okay, what is the core of each of these? In fact, any of these next number of slides could be your takeaway from today's message, perhaps based on the cause of your anxiety. If it is physical, then it looks like, well, what does it look like to get serious about taking care of myself physically? If it means I'm just not prioritizing my schedule well because I'm overcommitted and I'm doing too many things, well, maybe I need to say no to some of the things that are less important so I can prioritize my sleep or I can, so I can prioritize exercise and say my physical health is a top priority. Now, I think it's also important to notice that for some of us, you know, we, we've tried those things. We're, we're trying to sleep and we can't. Um, we want to eat healthy, but we're just drawn to junk food and foods that are terrible for us. That's why I was suggesting that the physical is often a little bit more surface level because there is something underneath that even drives those. But it's still an important step. It may be an important step to go to a doctor and see, is there anything off in terms of inside of my body that I need to address first so that I can stabilize before I go to some of the details? deeper conversations. When it comes to the personal wiring, for example, if you get to know you, get to know you and you will better anticipate threats to your peace. This looks like intentional work, figuring out what's going on inside of you. 
This might be on the other side of a trusted friend to reflect what it's like on the other side of you, perhaps on the other side of a mentor. I would argue that perhaps the greatest, the single greatest step, if you really want to get serious about your anxiety, is to get on the other side of a counselor who can professionally walk through what a lot of these steps look like. But as, I, as you get to know you, you'll discover what a lot of these steps are like. It could also be something a little bit simpler than you would think. You know, for me, for example, when I think about, you know, personality profiles that are out there, like the Enneagram, for example, that one is just so helpful for me because it speaks to core fears and core desires. And it helps you discover what the anxieties are for some of the very important people in your life. Well, my wife, Emily, for example, she is a six and sixes on the Enneagram literally are afraid of fear itself. Pretty much everything could be something that, that causes fear because sixes have an incredible imagination, which is very helpful. And they often think through the worst case uh, scenarios as a result. That can be anxiety inducing for her. She also values safety and stability and security as a result. So, you know, when I change plans frequently or all my ideas are going crazy or I'm not stable, I know that that can be something that causes anxiety for her. Me, on the other hand, I'm a three, which is the performer. So I value achievement and success and anything that might, you know, be a failure or anything that might, you know, harm reputation. Those are things that I fear that cause me anxiety. As I get to know me and I get to know the most important people in my life, it's clarifying and it gets to the root of what are triggers of anxiety. If when we went through that list, the secret side came up and that was you, perhaps thinking about what it looks like to confess is a way to lift some of that invisible weight of anxiety. It may be a small, uncomfortable conversation with one or a few people. I certainly am not advocating that you blast something on Facebook or you do a YouTube blog or anything like that. That's not what I'm saying here. But if it's something significant, if it's something that you know is going to disrupt the rhythm of your life, the rhythm of your family, the most important people to you, it may look like inviting in a third party. It may look like, again, getting on the other side of a counselor and thinking through what are the steps of this so that I don't just out of my guilt blurt it at the wrong time or in an inappropriate setting, but how do I embark upon this conversation? One of the most helpful things that Emily and I have come across in our time in counseling is the idea that short-term instability leads to long-term intimacy. And short-term chaos today is likely going to be better than that disconnection over a lifetime. It's better to fight for that relationship. If, as we went through this slide, came up for you and had energy for you, then perhaps if we're really going to address past hurts, mistakes, or traumas, things that we have not processed or healed from, we may indeed have to go back in order to go forward. And I understand that step is absolutely painful and absolutely takes an incredible amount of energy. I am not minimizing what it would take to do so. But if we are ever going to have a lasting, rather than just spreading that pain out over decades, if we're ever going to have lasting peace in those areas, if our past isn't going to keep getting out over the people we care about, we may have to go back to those kinds of places. Science literally shows the more we suppress the negative thoughts, the more we suppress the hurts, they literally boil up until ultimately we either shut down or explode. And that boiling, that kind of pressure that we feel as we ignore them and suppress them, that is the anxiety growing. However, what is it then that we do to get the root to the root of the spiritual? Um, I want to acknowledge, I, I just blew through some massive, massive steps that could be years and years and years of work and intentionality, right? I did that for two reasons. Um, one is just to try to honor and respect your time. The other reason is I'm, I'm not a doctor, at the end of the day, I am not a licensed counselor at the end of the day. And so I don't want to overstep, you know, my boundaries or, or where the authority kind of starts and ends. But, but when it comes to the spiritual, I want to spend the rest of our time talking about this. Because what I said last week in part one was I kind of pushed and challenged a little bit to say, I, I deeply understand and empathize with not wanting to over-spiritualize this conversation, not wanting to hear just have faith and it will all go away. I mean, I really get that. But I also said last week that you can't remove the spiritual from the conversation. Just like if you were to go to a doctor and say, you know, hey, I'm not going to stop eating fast food and I'm not going to work out, but fix me, help me. And they would push you towards the truth. I want to do the same here in this conversation because I love you enough to do so. And we said last week that a world without God 
If you remove the spiritual, that just should be, when we're honest, a more anxiety-inducing world. A world that is random, a world where you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, where there's no silver lining and things aren't being worked out for good. If not in this life, then at least the next one. If it, we live in that world where there is no God, it is a more anxiety-inducing world. I would like to argue that for many of us, maybe not all, but for many of us, the spiritual is the most foundational in this conversation. That's why when you see verses that look frustrating on the surface like this, cast all your anxiety on him that sounds like just have more faith, it's important to understand all of the context and understand what else Peter said. Because when you look at the verse in context, Peter actually gives a why right after this. He doesn't say like, hey, just have more faith. He gives us why we can go to our heavenly father. He says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Oh, meaning the God who made all of the galaxies and all of the stars, he, he also made you and his concerns are your concerns. Oh, means he's trustworthy. Oh, if somebody is willing to die for you, you don't ever have to wonder if they are for you. Have you ever been around a relationship that feels safe enough that when you are kind of spiraling or you are in a low place, just being around that person, even in silence, can bring some calm and some relief? Peter's saying that's why you can go to your heavenly father because he is trustworthy, he is safe, he cares for you. And he also warns and says, hey, if you don't go to him, you're gonna go to somewhere else. And you have to think about the alternative because the alternative probably isn't any better. Look what he says in the very next verse. The next verse, he says, be alert, and a sober mind, clear mind, be mentally healthy, fight for that because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In other words, there is an enemy and, and here we would take that enemy seriously and literally because Jesus did and we just go with what Jesus does. Even if you have a question about that, or you're confused by that, you're not sure what you think about that, I would be willing to bet that because of the fact you are a human being, there is probably a voice in your head that gets loud that gets negative, that gets repetitive, that cycles. And when the spiral starts to go, all it is is this reminders of things that aren't true about you, trying to tell you that you're not enough and you don't have what it takes and you're not a good husband and you're not a good father, and you're not a good mother. And if you were more like them and if you could just, and why do you keep going back here? And he's saying, hey, if you don't, if you don't go to your heavenly father with those thoughts, you're gonna go somewhere else. And I want to finish our time looking at the story of that individual where I said we get kind of a behind the scenes look and we get to see where he went with those thoughts that were spiraling. And the reason it's such a fascinating conversation and such a fascinating story to look at is because this individual is one of the heroes of the faith. His name is Elijah and Elijah was a prophet. Elijah did extraordinary things with God. It was almost like he had a special link or connection with him, spoke on his behalf and did these amazing, amazing miracles. In fact, where we pick up his story, he's actually coming off on the other side of his success, which truly is fascinating to think about because a, a lot of times we think about anxiety being kind of in the lows of life or we think about it when things haven't gone well, but anxiety can come on the other side of success too. Generally, when we're tired because we worked hard for success, we've reached some kind of pinnacle and now we don't know what is next or where our meaning comes from now. This is the place Elijah was in. He just had this tremendous victory. There's these hundreds of, of false prophets and he goes to war with them and it's just him and God against these hundreds of people and he wins with God. And now there's this queen that wants him dead. And she's like, because you killed my people, I'm gonna kill you. There's a price on his head. And Elijah does what you and I do when we're scared and we're afraid and he runs. Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. See, this is the same thing that you and I do. Now, I, hopefully there's not a queen that wants to kill you, but ultimately when we're afraid, we flee and we often go to the places that we're most familiar with. We go back to old habits. We go back to old patterns. This is what Elijah did. He fled into the wilderness. This is what he knew. This is what he was comfortable with. And at this point, Elijah's exhausted. At this point, Elijah thinks he's already seen his best days, that his best days are probably behind him. He's been running through the wilderness. He's lonely. He's hungry. And we see this raw place, this Elijah, this hero of the faith. We see this incredibly raw verse of where he is at. Tell me if you've ever been here. He says, 
he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Have you ever been there before? God, I've had enough. I cannot do it anymore. I am overwhelmed. I don't have the strength. If you've ever been there, then you are in the same place that one of the great heroes of the faith has been as well. And the next couple of verses to see what happens next are so simple and so insightful. Because look what Elijah does. Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. And then an angel comes. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him, comforted him, and said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead will be too much for you. So that's what he did. So he got up and he ate and he drank. And the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. Meaning, at times when you are at the end of yourself, the most spiritual thing that you can do is what Elijah did and take a nap and then have a meal. I do not want to, us to just, you know, look over this or to underestimate what a big deal this was, that that was the step to stabilize, to manage the depression, to manage the emotion first before we could really get to what was underneath it. I don't know if you've ever heard of the acronym HALT before. It stands for hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. And these are kind of the emotional or physical states that we can be in that when we're in those places, we are more susceptible to relapsing, whether it's to an addiction or to an old pattern of thought or behavior. And he was three of the four of these at least. He was hungry, lonely, and tired for sure. When we are in those places, do not underestimate how vulnerable we are to going back to the negativity, back to the unhealthy patterns. But now that he is kind of stabilized, now he is able to go and meet with God. He's able to go to get to the source. He goes to Mount Sinai where God gave Moses the 10 commandments and he has an interaction with the living God who shows up in a powerful way. And here's how that interaction goes. It says, as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by the presence of God and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. All this power, all this majesty. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a gentle whisper. See, you have an enemy that has to roar to get your attention because what he has to say is not true. And he's got to say it again and again and again and again and again until finally you start to wonder and you start to believe it. And the negative thought patterns, you start to wonder if that's reality for you. But he's far away and he has to roar to get your attention. He has to accuse you, to lie to you, to make you afraid. But you have a heavenly father who can whisper because he's not far from any one of us because he cares for you, because he's a personal God. And we get to see what he whispered to Elijah, a simple but powerful question. It says, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave in a voice, God's voice. Remember, not yelling, he's not shaming him, he's not condemning him. He just says, what are you doing here? What are you doing here, Elijah? Do you remember who you are? Do you remember what we've done together? Remember the plans I have for you? We're not done yet. Elijah, what are you doing here? What a powerful question to ask ourselves when we personally are spiraling. When we go back to those places, when we want to reach out to that person, when we open another browser, when we pour another drink, when we're going back to those places, what a question to ask, what am I doing here? This isn't who I am anymore. I'm not a little kid anymore. This isn't where I'm supposed to be. What if, like it was for Elijah, what if the solution to our anxiety 
is more about a somebody than a something. Elijah knew all this stuff. He knew all the things that were true, but he had to go be with his heavenly father for the solution. What I didn't mention earlier is I think I actually may understand the root of where all of those nightmares were coming from. Um, when I was four, I went on a guy's trip with my dad. It was one of the kind of first moments that, uh, you know, we were, went on a guy's trip because my mom was pregnant with my brother and we go to Chicago and we go hang out with my cousins who are way older than I am. And uh, we watch a movie that is trippy for anybody, for any adult, um, but certainly for a four-year-old. And that was Men in Black. And I don't know if you've seen Men in Black in a while, but there's aliens exploding out of people and all kinds of weird stuff. It'll mess with you. I think it jacked with me. And as I'm going through literally a couple of years of these night tears and all this kind of stuff, there was one thing that would work every single time, bar none. Even though I knew there were no monsters in the room and I'd done the search and all that, that was when I would go down the stairs and I would go into my parents' room and I would knock on the door and I would walk inside. I love my mom, but for whatever reason, I would always go to my dad's side for this. And I would snuggle up under his arm and he would whisper. He would say, what's wrong? I would say, I had the nightmare again. The monsters are back. And he would say, okay, I love you. Go to sleep. And I would, just like that. There was something about his presence that was more powerful than anything I could know or do or control myself. What if, instead of looking for something to control, we looked for somebody to give up control to? As I've gotten older, as I'm not a little kid anymore, but as I've become an adult, and as I think about those monsters that are now in my life, I think about opening a computer to a blank Google Doc and beginning the message prep com, you know, process and thinking about all the voices and all the ways that I think I'm going to let people down and how awful this is going to be and nobody's ever going to come back to North One again and you're so young and what do you know? And, you know, all these things start to spiral. And those kinds of moments, I just have to pause. When all the thoughts and feelings are coming and I think about the weight of leadership and I think about, you know, some of the drama and I think about the rumors that are started and I think about, oh my gosh, what's going to happen and are people going to leave and what is all this going to look like? When I'm alone at night and it's one o'clock in the morning and, and the thoughts are going and I can't go back to sleep and I feel the weight of the world and the weight of all the things I have to keep up with. There's books I've read and there's lines that are good and there's things that are helpful and there's good stuff like that. But the most helpful thing has been to let go of control and say, my heavenly father is so close to me right now in this moment that he could whisper to me because he cares for me and he's with me. Whatever anxiety is robbing of you, I want you to get it back. Let's pray. Father, thank you that not only do you understand our anxieties, but you are with us through these anxieties. God, you care for us. You're a personal God. You're close enough to whisper to us. God, I just ask that as we navigate these complex ideas and topics, things that we can't just muscle up and have enough sort of self-control with God, but it's, it's deeper than that. God, that you would be with us, that you would meet us, that you would remind us that you love us. And then as we take steps in the direction of mental health, you would give us the steps to do so and the strength to do so. Father, we love you. We need you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.